Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, Pete Hickey's completion seminar. Uh, I'll just begin by telling you a little bit, bit about Pete's history. He was doing a degree in mathematics and statistics across at Melbourne Uni, and in 19, excuse me, 19, wrong century, uh, 2008, he uh, took up an offer to become a Europe scholar with Melanie Barlow. And so that in that year, he basically dived into genetics and bioinformatics. And that was in his third year. And so it was natural, perhaps, all going well, that he would do his honours year at WeHi, and that's what he did. So he did a really great honours year and got a publication in a really good journal, jointly with Melanie. So that's generally a good sign of success possible PhD material, but he didn't want to go straight on to do a PhD. He spent another year in Melanie's lab as an RA, research assistant, and uh, towards the end of that decided he would do a PhD. So he started off uh, 2011 with a PhD in a particularly theoretical topic, and uh, at some moment, not very far into that year, I think he felt a great... Uh, hunger for data, and uh, then maybe the theory wasn't quite as appealing as it was. So he came over and chatted to me, and we found a theory problem that had data with it. And uh, that's the problem you're going to hear about today, and you'll be happy to hear you're going to hear the theory side, the data side of it, not the theory side of it. So this is the data that we uh, managed to keep Pete happy with. That's masses of methylation data. He's going to show you how to make sense of it. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, Terry, and thank you all very much for coming along today. So yes, to begin things off, I am a statistician, which I realise isn't the greatest opening line of all time, but I'm going to try and convince you that statistics is quite interesting uh, and it's quite creative. It's not just computing p-values. There's quite a lot of um, creative work that goes into it. So I thought, what's the best way, as a statistician, I could start my talk? And of course, the answer is with a graph. And this is actually how I've spent my time as a PhD student since January 13 of this year broken down by various categories. And you can see that one of the things I spend the vast, or well, a lot of time on is coding, which is writing software to analyze the sorts of experiments that I'm analyzing. Uh, and I've spent, just in this year alone, nearly 600 hours on this. Uh, various other categories, I'm still working as an RA, so there's a bit of work there. Writing which should ideally be slightly longer, but it hasn't quite got there yet. But I want to give you a bit of an idea of what a statistician actually does for a PhD, particularly in bioinformatics. So my work is done at a computer, and this is how I spend my days. <laughs> on a good day, it's something like this, and on a not so good day, it's more like that. My research is done completely at a computer. I've never done any lab work, so this is how, that's how I do my work. But the project aim when I did come back to WeHi, and I was quite happy that I did get to come back to WeHi, was quite broad, was simply how it was the best way to analyze these types of experiments. Whole genome by sulfide sequencing, which I'll explain in a moment, to study DNA methylation. So there's a number of different sort of uh, ways we do this. And one of the big things that I've been doing is just simply what's called exploratory data analyses, which is simply looking at a lot of different data sets and looking at quite low level uh, data. So not, not big summaries, but the very raw data that comes off the sequencing machine. So this is quite a time-consuming task, but it's also a very interesting task, and you can learn a lot just by looking. The second key aspect is developing methods to analyze these. And there's two sort of sides to this. There's developing them, and then there's actually implementing them. Because as far as I'm concerned, doing bioinformatics, a key part is actually implementing your ideas in, for instance, software that is usable by other people. There's not much use coming up with a method that other people can't use. So I consider that quite an important part of my PhD project. And another main part has been collaboration. So most of my work is simply not possible without the collaboration of uh, biologists and other scientists. I'm not one myself, so I need them to also explain the ideas to me, but to also provide the data for me to look at and to hopefully feed back useful stuff to them. <coughs> so now onto the science. I'm going to begin by telling you a bit about DNA methylation. Uh, and a particular assay called whole genome by sulfide sequencing. So to begin with, a simple cartoon of double-stranded DNA. We've got A's pairings with T's and C's pairing with G's. 
So DNA methylation, when people say this, they are actually generally referring to what is known as cytosine methylation. Other DNA bases can be methylated in some organisms, but in mammalian systems, such as humans and mice, which is where I've been working on, uh, uh, cytosine methylation is synonymous with DNA methylation. And in particular, in mammals, uh, the most frequently uh, methylated cytosine is what's called a CPG dinucleotide. So a CPG is simply a C followed by a G in the linear DNA sequence. And one of the important things about a CPG dinucleotide is that it is symmetric across the strands. So where you have a CG on this strand, you have one on the opposing strand. So DNA methylation, or more specifically cytosine methylation, is the addition of a methyl group to the cytosine residue. And I'm here I'm just denoting that by an M. For a slightly less cartoony cartoon, uh, here's uh, the cytosine residue. And 5-methylcytosine uh, is the name of the modification where we have a uh, methyl group, which is three hydrogens and a carbon, at the C5 position of the cytosine residue. And that's laid down by an enzyme called a DNA methyltransferase, of which there are several different ones in humans and mice and with uh, similar ones in other organisms such as plants. So to reiterate, we've got double-stranded DNA. I'm talking about DNA and methylation, but when I say that, I basically mean cytosine methylation. And for the remainder of the talk, I'm really talking about CPG methylation, which is the most common form of methylation in mammalian systems. There is non-CG methylation, which plays an important role in certain situations, but compared to CG methylation, it is quite low level. So that's what DNA methylation is, and this is what it can actually do. So what we have here are two mice that are phenotypically very different. Quite obviously, one is yellow and one is brown, and the yellow mouse is also much larger than the brown mouse. And these two mice are, in fact, genetically identical. This phenotypic difference you see between these two mice is due to a difference in their methylation, in particular at a locus known as the agouti viable yellow locus. I'm going to talk a bit more about these mice later in my talk. The way that DNA methylation is resulting in these uh, phenotypic changes is in part due to regulation of gene expression. So this is the sort of classical, if simplified, version of how DNA methylation is affecting gene expression. Here we have a gene model where we have the promoter region followed by the exons. And in an expressed gene, what we typically see is that cytosines within the promoter region, of which there are often quite a few, are typically unmethylated when the gene is expressed. In contrast, in a gene that's not expressed, we often find that the promoter region contains a large number of methylated cytosines, here denoted by Ms. So this is one way in which DNA methylation can influence and regulate the gene expression and ultimately phenotypic variation. So that's the sort of simplified version. And in truth, it's not quite so clear cut. What we have here are some data from the Cancer Genome Atlas project. And we have here along the x-axis the level of methylation at the promoter of this particular gene called AMT against the level of gene expression of that same gene. And each point in this plot corresponds to a sample from this study of ovarian carcinoma. And you can clearly see that the increased, pro, uh, increased promoter methylation results in a reduced gene expression. And this is a very nice picture of this, and it was in fact chosen because it is a nice picture. Uh, when you look at this uh, more generally, the correlation isn't as strong. Uh, but this is uh, one instance where it is a nice, simple story. Uh, cancer is a particular, well, a focus of DNA methylation research because uh, Modified or aberrant DNA methylation patterns are a hallmark of cancer and, in fact, a therapeutic target in some particular cancers. So it has another important roles in things such as X inactivation and also during embryonic development and gametogenesis. So that's a bit about why DNA methylation is of interest. Now I'm going to tell you about this assay called bisulfide sequencing, which we use to study it. So returning to the simple double-stranded uh, cartoon example, in the bisulfite sequencing assay, we denature the uh, DNA. That is, we have a single strand now. Now, in a DNA sequencing experiment, we would typically then PCR amplify this so that we have a sufficient amount to sequence. But if you PCR amplify DNA uh, methylation, you lose the mark. And I'll illustrate this um, as follows. So rather than Ms being tagged on for methylation, now I'm using a red C to denote a methylated cytosine and a blue C to denote an unmethylated cytosine. 
So if you simply PCR amplify this, you get back your sequence, but you lose the methylation signal. And obviously this is not desirable if you're studying DNA methylation. So instead, we need to pre-treat the DNA with a chemical called sodium bisulfite. And what this does is it has no effect on A's, G's, or T's. An un, uh, a methylated cytosine remains a cytosine, whilst an unmethylated, uh, sorry, uh, uh, no, that's right, sorry. Unmethylated cytosine becomes a uracil. We then PCR uh, amplify that, and A's remain A's, G's remain G's, T's remain T's, C's remain C's, and the uracils are converted to thymines. So by comparing the original DNA sequence to the bisulfite-treated sequence, we can infer whether the cytosine was methylated or unmethylated by whether it was, remains a C or was converted to a T. So if we do this bisulfite treatment of DNA, combine it with a high-throughput sequencer, such as the Illumina HiSec, we can do whole genome bisulfite sequencing, sequencing, which simply means whole genome sequencing studying DNA methylation. And that's the assay uh, from which the data I have been analysing come from. So when we sequence these, we're actually, an important point to emphasise is that these um, assays are using a pool of cells. Uh, there are, there's, there are single cell uh, techniques available, but they are not, not widespread. And so when we are performing whole genome bisulfide sequencing, we're measuring, in a sense, the average level of methylation in a population of cells. So when we perform the sequencing of this particular fragment, we get out what he, I'm going to symbolise using what's called a lollipop plot. So a black lollipop means that we sequenced it and we inferred that it was methylated. A white lollipop means we uh, sequenced and inferred it to be unmethylated. So when we sequence, we sequence uh, from the pool of cells and so we get a sample from that cell, uh, from that population of cells. And so we get one read being like this, a second read being like this, a third read, and a fourth read in this case. And the point I want to emphasise here is that differences between the reads, for instance, between the second and the third read, don't, aren't necessarily due to sequencing error or to errors in the bisulfite conversion process, but actually reflect the fact that there is heterogeneity within the population of cells in the level of DNA methylation. And this is in contrast to instance for studying straight DNA where you would typically find that all the cells have identical uh, genetic sequence. We then summarise these. Once we, have, we take these uh, reads, we map them back to the genome, uh, and we then summarise these by the, uh, something called the beta value. And it's really quite simple. It's simply the proportion of reads that are methylated at that position. So for this position here, we have a beta value of three out of three. For this position, four out of four, two out of four, and zero out of four. So it's not just, uh, we need to keep track of the denominator in this case as well, because these two sites here both have, are both fully methylated but we have more sequencing reads here, so we have more confidence that we're getting a good estimate of the level of methylation. So we want to keep track of not only the, uh, the ratio, but the denominator as well. We then want to look at how methylation varies along the genome, for instance. And so we can plot the level of methylation along the genome. So what we have here, along the x-axis, each one of these black tick marks corresponds to a CPG in the reference genome, in this case from the mouse genome. You can see that there are regions of high CPG density, that is there's lots of the black tick marks, and regions of lower density. And these regions of high CPG density are known as CPG islands. These CPG islands often coincide with the promoter regions of a, dream, uh, of a gene. In this case, uh, this is a gene on the reverse strand, so transcription starts here, reading in that direction. And we have here what is called a CPG island promoter. We can then plot the level of methylation along the genome. So each point here corresponds to the beta value for a single CPG from a single sample. The size of the point is proportional to the co sequencing coverage. So a big point means we sequence that position in multiple, uh, from multiple cells in our population, so we have quite a good estimate there. A smaller, val a smaller point means we have few, uh, less sequencing coverage. And there's a few things that are pretty obvious here, one being that we have uh, a lack of methylation across this CPG island, and I'll return to that in just a moment. Another thing to point out is that whilst this is a whole genome assay, there are certain positions where you simply don't get 
any measurements. And that's just due to the stochastic nature of sequencing. For instance, this CPG here, we have no uh, information based on this, um, from this assay. However, given we can see there's quite a lot of structure to this data, we may be able to infer what this position was. So I'm going to take a slight sidetrack now just to explain the data that I'm going to use for quite a few of the examples in this talk. And these data come from uh, a paper from Ryan Lister, who's now at University of Western Australia. Um, and he and colleagues performed whole genome by sulfide sequencing of a number of um, cell lines. In particular, uh, I'm going to use these three cell lines to illustrate um, the methods that I've developed. So the ADS cell line is a adipose tissue. And these two second cell lines, ADS adipose and ADS IPSC, are related to this. Specifically, ADS adipose are adipocytes derived from this adipose tissue. And the ADS IPSC cell line are induced pluripotent stem cells, which have been created based on the ADS cell line. So there's a sort of hierarchy here to the, da the, um, the data. These were sequenced using 75 base pair paired end um, sequencing to a fairly good coverage of 20 to 25x. So the reason I mention these is now that I'm going to show you some data from those samples. So we can look at the methylation levels along the genome, or we could look at what does the, uh, the average level of methylation look like across the genome as a whole. So what we have here are histograms of the genome-wide methylation levels. So for instance, this sample here, the ADS sample, we see that we have a spike at zero, meaning there is about, in this case, about 2 million CPGs in this sample that are almost completely unmethylated. And for, uh, there's about, in, in this human data, there are about 25 million CPGs per sample for reference. So you can see across the three samples, all of them have a spike at one, and all of them have a cluster of points closer to one. Uh, sorry, a, a, a spike at zero and a cluster of points closer to one. So we have a, a number of CPGs that are almost completely unmethylated, but the majority of CPGs are mostly methylated. And that's true of most mammalian, uh, most mammalian cells. We have a subset that are mostly unmethylated, and then the rest of them are mostly methylated. The two somatic cell lines, the ADS and ADS adipose, have very similar profiles, whereas the induced pluripotent stem cell is missing, in a sense, the intermediate methylation values. These intermediate values are regions of uh, are sites that are heterogeneous within the population of cells. So this can be interpreted as being that the IPSC cell lines have less heterogeneity in methylation than do either of the somatic cell lines. And this is in part due to the fact that when inducing pluripotency, we effectively reset the DNA methylome, which is the methylation pattern along the genome, um, whereas in the somatic cells, as they divide, there is uh, stochastic error in copying or replicating the methylation mark to the daughter cell, and these um, result in heterogeneity. It also reflects potentially uh, different populations of cells within, for instance, the adipose tissue, uh, having slightly different methylation profiles. So that's the spike at zero and one uh, is partly explained by these islands that I referred to earlier. CPGs that are inside CPG islands, which are shown here in orange, are typically unmethylated, whereas CPGs outside of the islands, here shown in purple, span the full range of methylation values. So the islands are typically unmethylated, whereas the non-islands are where you find most of the methylated CPGs. So returning to the picture of before, where we're plotting the methylation level along the genome, we can try and, rather than show you all the points, I'm going to use some curves to uh, summarize. And this, in this particular case, is a low S curve, and it's just used to visualize the methylation profile, if you, if you like. So this is the profile for one sample. Key points are that along the island, we're typically unmethylated, and outside of the island, we typically increase in methylation, as we saw in the previous plots. Another thing is that we can see, even in the raw data, oh, particularly in the raw data, I should say, that when we're unmethylated, we tend to stay unmethylated. When we're methylated, we tend to stay methylated. So this is an idea uh, of correlation here. We, there's some, quite a lot of structure to this data. One site's CPG is quite similar to the next site's. So now if we look across different samples, we can see a few more patterns. The first is that the curves themselves, each line here is from a different mouse. And I'll explain these data later in the talk in more detail. The point here I want to get across is that the curves themselves are actually quite similar 
uh, as of the raw data. The curves here are just for summarization. But you can see across this region here, the curves have been shifted. There is a different average level of methylation in these five mice across this region here. And in fact, one of the original goals of the project um, was to identify these types of regions, which are called differentially methylated regions. But we got a little bit sidetracked, it's fair to say, and got interested in understanding this correlation structure of what, how CPGs near one another are related in their methylation level and what we can uh, learn about this and how we can exploit this in our statistical analyses of the data. So that's this idea called co-methylation. And this was what I've, I spent the first year to, well, first one to two years of my PhD working on. And so I'm going to spend a bit of time telling you about this today. So there's a couple of different definitions of co-methylation um, going around. The first is the idea that co-methylation is the presence of methylation over a stretch of neighboring CPG positions. So in this case, we would say that the six CPGs in the red box here are co-methylated. They have the same methylation pattern. Closer to what we mean by co-methylation is the idea that co-methylation is correlation. In particular, it's the relationship between the degree of methylation over distance. So over distance is one of the key things we were interested in. How far apart do CPG's methylation levels uh, depend on one another? And what can we say about this? So we looked at this in two different ways. The first, which we call within fragment co-methylation, which was something that was relatively new that other people had not um, tried to do before and is only possible with uh, these sequencing data. And the second is a simpler idea, which is the correlation of the beta values. And I'll explain each of these and how they relate to one another. So the first, within fragment co-methylation, what I'm showing here is a, a genome browser view of a small region of the genome. Along here, we have the sequence in the reference genome and underlined by these two blue bars are CPGs in the reference genome. Each one of the gray and green lines correspond to a sequencing read from a single sample that is from a whole genome by sulfite sequencing experiment that's been mapped back to the genome. And what we're interested in is what can we say about methylation dependence between this site and this site. The way we do this is to take all reads that overlap both CPGs, which I've highlighted here in yellow. So this read overlaps both, uh, whereas this read in gray only overlaps one. So we're not using that for this analysis. What we do then is for all those reads highlighted in yellow, we tally up the methylation states. So for instance, this read here is methylated and methylated, so it contributes a one to this table. Similarly, we have two reads that are methylated at the first CPG and unmethylated at the second, no reads that are unmethylated at the first and methylated at the second, and four reads that are unmethylated at both positions. So just from these numbers alone, you can see that it's more likely they will be in the same methylation state. And we wanted to be able to quantify this so that we could study it statistically. And the way we have quantified this is using a measure called the odds ratio or the log odds ratio. And it's a very simple statistic for these two by two tables. We simply take this number here, multiply it by this number here, divide it by this number here, times this number here, where we add a half to all of the counts just so that we don't divide by zero. We then take the logarithm of this, and that is called the log odds ratio. And the way to interpret this is that a log odds ratio of about of zero or close to zero means that the two CPGs are effectively independent of one another. Their methylation levels do not depend on one another. A positive value means that we expect that they are more likely to be in the same methylation state. So if the first is methylated, we expect the second to be methylated. And a negative odds ratio, log odds ratio means that we are more likely to be in opposite states. So in this particular case here, with a log odds ratio of 2.4, we're about four times more likely to be in the same methylation state. So that's for one pair, but there are 25 million CPGs in the genome, in the human genome, thereabouts. The two different DNA strands we can study separately. So there's about 50 million pairs which we want to study. And basically what we want to have is for each uh, of these pairs, we want the chromosome, the strand, the position of the two CPGs, and a count of how often each pattern occurs. Unfortunately, there was no software to do this, and so I had to write my own, and that was uh, quite a bit of work. And in fact, I had a version that worked in the first year of my PhD, but unfortunately, it was quite slow. 
and simply meant this wasn't going to scale to the types of uh, data sets we were wanting to look at. So more recently, I rewrote it, uh, and I'm pretty happy with it because now I've got it down from 30 minutes to three hours per sample, which means that I can feasibly study multiple samples per day. And in particular, um, for some context, I processed about 50 to 60 samples in the two weeks leading up to this talk. So without being able to rewrite the software and make quite um, substantial improvements to it, I would have had to have started writing my talk back in about February. So that's software for pulling out the information about the pairs of CPGs. We also we then start compute these odds ratios for all pairs, and we want to look at how these odds ratios vary as a function of the distance. So how, as the CPGs get further apart, what happens to the dependence? So what I'm showing here is for all CPGs in this ADS sample where they're separated by 10 base pairs. So there are lots of pairs along the genome where there is separation of 10 base pairs. For each of those pairs, we construct that, the table, we compute the odds ratio, and then I've plotted here a histogram of those log odds ratios. What you can see, I hope, is that the odds ratio, log odds ratios are all, the center of the distribution is shifted away from zero, meaning, and in particular, it's shifted towards the positive values, meaning for CPGs separated by about 10, by separated by 10 base pairs, we generally have a strong degree of dependence between their methylation states. In particular, um, between two and four means we're about four to 16 times more likely to be in the same methylation state. So that's summarizing it for a one distance, 10 base pairs, but we wanted to study it for two base pairs, three base pairs, four base pairs. Uh, we could of course just do histograms for all of these, but it gets pretty tedious um, trying to compare these. And so we've come up a different, with a different way of visualizing this information. First of all, we flip the histogram on its side. So that's, this is the exact same figure as before, but now we have the odds ratio running on the y-axis and the counts on the x-axis. We then summarize this histogram by, for instance, the median value from the histogram. So 50% of the um, odds ratios are below about three and 50% are above three when the distance is 10. We also compute, for instance, the 25th and 75th percentiles of this, these, these distributions and the 10th and 90th. So what we've done is take this histogram and summarize it by five points, similar to a box plot. That's for a single distance, and then we compute these five numbers for all the distances. In, so in dark green is the median log odds ratio as a function of the distance. In the innermost dark green bands are the 25th to 75th percentiles, and the outermost light green bands are the 10th to 90th percentiles. So what you can see is that as the distance increases between the CPGs, the dependence decays as a function of the distance. So CPGs closer to one another have a higher degree of dependence than do those that are further apart. The second thing to point out is that for any given distance, for instance 10, there is a, quite a bit of variation. Just knowing that two CPGs are 10 base pairs apart doesn't tell us exactly how strong it, um, the dependence is gonna be. It may range from about an odds ratio of one through to a log odds ratio of about six, which is uh, from twofold through to about 64 fold uh, difference in dependence. This graph finishes at just under 200 base pairs, and that's due to the limitations of sequencing lengths at this time. We have DNA fragments that are about 200 base pairs. We're doing 75 base pair paired end reads, so we can only look at pairs up to a certain distance apart because we require that the pair come from the same read. Furthermore, the pairs that I'm showing here today are only pairs where there's no CPG in between. And I can happy to explain why we've done that um, in the questions. So that was for a single sample, and then we can compare between samples. So this is the ADS, this is the adipose tissue, the adipocytes derived from that, and the induced pluripotent stem cell line. The two somatic lines are very similar. Their distributions of the dependence are very similar. In contrast, the pluripotent stem cell line, the distributions have been shifted up, meaning that the dependence within uh, pluripotent stem cell lines is far higher than it is in either of these lines. And we see similar things in other uh, experiments comparing somatic cell lines to iPSC cell lines. So I mentioned that it's not just the distance that influences how strongly two things are co-methylated. 
but also other features. And one of these main features we found was this, whether the pair of CPGs belonged to a CPG island or outside of an island. So each sample here is in a row. And the orange are the CPG pairs that are in islands, the purple, those outside of islands. And the orange distributions are shifted up compared to the purple distributions, meaning that within the CPG island, the level of comethylation is higher than outside of the CPG island. These graphs are truncated at about 100 base pairs simply because when you're inside an island, it's very rare to find a pair of CPGs separated by a, great, a large distance because the definition of a CPG island is one where there is a high CPG density, where there are lots of CPGs close to one another. So that's the idea of comethylation within individual DNA fragments. The second idea is one of the correlation of these beta values. So these beta values, to remind you, are measures of the average level of methylation in a sample. They're not from individual reads, but aggregated across all the reads in the sample. But the idea is pretty similar. We take pairs of CPGs separ separated by a common distance. In this case, 10 base pairs. And we take, rather than the individual read level measurements, we take the beta values for those. And we plot the first of the pair on the x-axis and the second of the pair on the y-axis. And you just simply compute the correlation of this scatter plot. And in this case, the correlation is quite high, 0.95. You can see that most of the data fall along the diagonal. These bands that you can see at certain values are simply because we have discrete data. So we have uh, the denominators are integers, and so we get these, these bands along the plot. So that's for one distance. We do the same thing for another distance, in this case 100 base pairs. Compute the correlation. In this case, we have fewer data points because there are fewer pairs separated by 100 base pairs. And unlike the previous within fragment correlations, now we can go out to any distance we want because we don't require the measurements to have come from the same sequencing reads. So in this case, we've gone out to 1,000 base pairs. And there are very few observations, but we can still compute a correlation in this case uh, of 0.019. So we, can, we do this for all dif different distances. For every di pair of every distance, we create a scatter plot, we compute the correlation, and then we plot these correlations against distance. So a similar plot to before, distance between CPGs on the x-axis and the correlation on the y-axis. You can see that for very close CPGs within about 1 to 200 base pairs, they are quite highly correlated. But it drops off quite quickly and then sort of flattens or plateaus out at around about 0.2. One thing that we've been interested in is that for any distance that we go out to, we haven't really seen this correlation actually go to zero, um, which is a little, uh, we, was a little bit surprising to us and is something we've been investigating with some other ideas that I'm not going to talk about today. So again, that's for a single plot. If we compare between different cell types, again, the ADS and ADS adipose samples, the two somatic lines are quite similar, whereas the IPSC cell line has a slight difference, which I'll um, amplify by zooming in on the first 500 base pairs of this graph. So the point I want to show you here that's different between the two is you can see a periodicity or a waviness in both of these that isn't quite as apparent in this induced pluripotent stem cell line. Now, this periodicity corresponds to a distance of about 170 base pairs which actually fits in quite nicely with the spacing of, uh, well, of DNA wrapped around nucleosomes. And so we believe that these periodicities are in fact being driven by higher order chromatin structure in these samples. And that the lack of signal in the induced pluripotent stem cell line may be due to uh, not as well uh, organized chromatin structure, although we're unable to verify this because we don't have any uh, assays on these particular cell lines that would allow us to look at the chromatin structure. But we've seen it consistently across the somatic lines versus the pluripotent cell lines. Again, we looked at these separately for CPG islands and non-CPG islands. So in orange are the CPG islands and the purple are the non-islands. All this jagged noise here is simply because we have very few um, data points at, this, um, at these, so our estimates jump around a lot, essentially. But you can see over the regions where we have nice stable observations, that the islands are consistently more correlated than outside of islands. So they're the two types of co-methylation we've explored. And there's been in, we've been interested in this for 
a number of reasons. First, just for the biology's sake, what can, we, what can we learn about the structure of DNA methylation data? We also would like to exploit this information in our methods for analysing this data. And in particular, we've been using this to develop a model for simulating DNA methylation data. Now, the reason we're interested in simulating DNA methylation data is whenever you're developing a new statistical method, you want to be able to test it and validate it on data where you know the answer. So when we can simulate data, we know the truth, and we can see how well our method does at recovering that truth. And we can also compare competing methods against one another on the same data set where we know the truth. And so I've been writing software, which I call MethSim, which simulates data from whole genome by sulfide sequencing experiments. And this is something that just didn't exist. Uh, methods that did exist were ignoring the correlation structure of the data. So effectively, they weren't simulating data that really reflected the, the true complexities of the real biology. So in the last 15 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, less about a method and more about an application. And this was some work that came out of a collaboration with uh, Emma Whitelaw, who's at La Trobe University. And this is a study of the methylome, which is the methylation pattern along the genome of this agouti viable yellow mouse model, which is a very famous mouse model in the study of DNA methylation. So the AVY mouse is the mouse I showed you uh, earlier in the talk, where we had a large yellow mouse and a small brownish mouse. But in fact, the co coat colours run the full spectrum from yellow through to brown, which is known as pseudo agouti. These mice, these six mice in this case, are genetically identical. Yet they have very different coat colours and uh, other associated uh, differences due to differences in the methylation of the agouti viable yellow locus. So Emma did some, uh, uh, some of the foundational work on studying this mouse model. And more recently, she's been applying this new technique of whole genome by sulphide sequencing to not just study this AVY locus, but look more generally for methylation differences in these mice. So in this particular experiment, we have five mice, C57 black six background. From each of these, we get a liver sample, which is used for whole genome by sulphide sequencing. And these five mice are isogenic, genetically identical, with an asterisk because there are some uh, slight differences, which I'll explain now. The first is the coat colors, and that's due to the methylation differences. We have one yellow, AVY mouse, we have one brown or pseudo agouti AVY mouse, and we have three wild type mice. These three wild type mice are littermates, and these two mice are also on the same C57 black 6 background with the addition of this AVY locus plus around three megabases from the C3H genome, which comes along for the ride when you insert the AVY locus. So they've been back crossed to eliminate most of the genetic variation, but there's a three megabase region where these five mice are genetically different. So we've got five mice. We perform high coverage, whole genome by sulfide sequencing. And what we get out is a very expensive experiment. Now, I got involved in this because they had the data sitting there, um, and, but weren't sure how to analyze it. Because this experiment is a little non-standard for studying for, for whole genome by sulfide sequencing. Most studies to date have been of studies comparing one group versus another group. For instance, colon cancers versus normal colon tissue. So you have a very well-defined structure where you're looking for differences in this group compared to this group. In this case, what Emma and um, her colleagues were interested in was finding any regions of the genome where any of the subset of the mice, so where one of the mice was different from the other four, or where two of the mice were different to the other three. So we don't have a well-defined group in advance. Effectively, we have one group, which is the five mice, and we're just looking for regions where the five mice aren't the same. And there wasn't any software or methods um, for analyzing bisulfite sequencing data available. Uh, and they came to us, and uh, Terry and myself, and asked, can we help them? And I said yes, because I wanted more data. And they wanted stuff really quickly. So we had to not only develop a method, but write software to implement this method uh, pretty quickly. So, Statistically, it's not the most rigorous approach going around, and there are certainly refinements that could be made, but the aim was to give them some regions that they could then follow up and look at more closely in a larger cohort, for instance, to validate. What they were interested in finding are what's called epi alleles. 
which are regions of the genome where the mice are genetically identical but have a different methylation pattern. So to illustrate these, here we have the five mice and a, this hypothetical region where they are genetically identical, which is the vast majority of the genome in this case. In this case, the yellow mouse is largely unmethylated across this region, whereas the other four mice are largely methylated. So that's an example of an epi allele. But it could also be a case where the epi allele occurs in the brown, the pseudo agouti mouse. And they were also interested in the case where the epi allele occurred in, for instance, one of the wild type mice. So we had to allow for all these possible combinations. So the method that we came up with um, was, has three steps. The first is to find CPGs where one of these mice or more is not like the other. The second step is to find runs of sites where there are differences. And the third site, the third test, is whether the region is consistent. And I'll explain these with illustrations. So the first step is to find CPGs where the five mice have a different level of methylation, where some, where some of the mice have a different level of methylation. <laughs> So this is an example where there is no difference. For each CPG, we count up the number of methylated and unmethylated reads for each of the five mice. And in, for, in, for instance, in this uh, particular CPG, almost all the mice are complete, oh, the mice are almost completely methylated. We test this using a chi-squared test, or more generally a log-linear model of this table, and we get out a test statistic or a p-value, which um, we then use to classify the tables as showing evidence of differential methylation or not. So in this case, we get a large p-value because the mice are similarly methylated. In contrast, here is a CPG where there is a difference. In this case, the first four mice are almost entirely methylated at, the, at this CPG, whereas the fifth mouse is effectively heterozygously methylated. So this is the sort of CPG we want to identify, and indeed our method assigns such a table a small p-value, meaning we can identify these quite quickly and can do the computations uh, quite quickly, more importantly, because there are about 20 million CPGs that we need to do this for. So we do this for all the CPGs in the genome, and then we take all those CPGs that have a p-value less than a threshold. Now, to do this more rigorous, rigorously, we would want a well-defined threshold, a more rigorous statistical procedure to uh, choose the threshold. In this case, uh, we have simply thresholded uh, on a fairly arbitrary value because what we're interested in is not the individual sites, but whether they cluster. So what we do is we declare all sites less than our arbitrary threshold as being candidate differentially methylated CPGs, or DMCs. And then we're interested in finding, are there runs of DMCs, position, regions of the genome where this site is a differentially methylated site, as is the next one, as is the next one. And I call this method run DMC. <laughs> so the idea, threshold, find runs, and we want all the CPGs in the run to be less than the threshold, and we also want those CPGs to be near to one another. We don't want to be making runs where the CPGs are separated by a long distance, because biologically, we, uh, uh, Harry, who's the postdoc working on this project, and Emma were not particularly interested in such things. So we do this whilst also allowing for in CPGs in between that perhaps have missing data or just miss the threshold of significance because we don't want to break the runs too often uh, in that case. We found we then needed to filter these candidate runs because most of the runs consisted of only two or three sites, which is not particularly interesting. So we said, oh, there must be at least so many CPGs in a region for us to be interested in it. The final thing that we need to filter on and test is, are the regions consistent? And this is what I think of as being, are the neighbours different in the same way? So to explain what I mean by that rather confusing sentence, here is a region that is called as being differentially methylated from our Run-DMC algorithm. Each point here is the methylation level from one of the five mice, where the colour of the point reflects the, uh, whether it is a wild type, which is shown in black, yellow being the, the yellow AVY mouse, and brown being the pseudo agouti AVY mouse. And you can see that for each of the sites, indeed there, there is a difference between the five mice in the level of methylation. For instance, the wild type mice at this site are largely methylated, whereas the AVY mouse have an intermediate level of methylation. And the same is true for each of these. We have a significant difference at each of the sites. But if you look at the order 
of the site, of the sam samples within each site, we see that the order changes. In particular, whereas this site we have the uh, three wild type mice as being highly methylated compared to the other two mice, in this case it is the pseudo agouti mouse that is most highly methylated. The three uh, wild types in between and the yellow mouse most slowly methylated. And this is not what we are really interested in identifying, these types of regions, because it is not a region that is different within any one particular mouse. It is a region that's different across the five mice. So we wanted to be able to at least flag these regions as being ones that we want to be a bit more cautious of because they don't actually reflect a difference within any particular mouse. And briefly what we do for that is in our statistical model, we test for a three-way interaction between the mouse, the sample, and the methylation level, and we can, and this will basically flag regions which we uh, should be suspicious of. Statistically, this isn't exactly actually what we want, but we found in practice that it's a pretty good way of flagging those regions that have potential inconsistencies. We also found, though, that generally speaking, there weren't too many regions we actually had to look at. These mice did not have widespread methylation differences, so generally we were able to simply look at the raw data. So plenty of plots, and that's true of all the work I've been doing. Whenever we've got some results, we want to look at the raw data to make sure that our statistical analysis makes sense with what we see in the raw data. Ideally, we see a region like this that I showed earlier in my talk where we have a difference in the average level of methylation between the five mice that is consistent across the entire region. For instance, sample five is consistently higher than any of the other mice. And this is uh, the sort of candidate regions that are most of interest to Emma and Harry. So to summarize what I've been up to, the first is something that I haven't actually really talked about. And I'm going to start with three quotes ranging from the slightly profound to the very not profound whatsoever. Uh, the first is that a lot of work as a bioinformatician is dealing with the thorns, which is dealing with messy data dealing with technical biases, particularly when you're working on a new assay, that there aren't well-established principles for analysing. And what I would have liked to have had in that uh, earlier figure at the start of my, plot, uh, of my talk showing how much time I spend on things is I wish I'd started recording that at the start of my PhD because the chart for uh, cleaning data and getting it into the right format would probably be somewhere out here because it is a huge part of doing bioinformatics. So unfortunately, in some sense, this means that I don't get as much time to actually spend on the biology. And for me, that's not such a big issue in that I'm doing a PhD in statistics. I need to develop methods. It's not simply about getting biological insights. I hope that the methods I develop can be used by others to develop these, and they can avoid some of the thorns that I had to deal with. The second is a favorite quote of Terry's, which is that you can actually, from the baseball coach and uh, uh, catcher, Yogi Berra, who said, you can observe a lot by watching. And this simply means that by doing lots of exploratory analyses, we can learn a lot about the structure of the data, the technical biases, et cetera, that we simply couldn't do if we summarized and just put it into a statistical, fancy statistical method straight away. There's still a huge benefit to doing lots of very low level analyses, lots of looking at plots, and that's what I've spent a lot of my time doing. And by far the least uh, profound statement is from the renowned poet and philosopher Robert Van Winkle, who said, stop, collaborate, and listen. Uh, Robert Van Winkle may be better known to as Vanilla Ice. Um, basically, collaboration as a bioinformatician is essential, um, I think, for doing um, most of your work because you need data, you need people to tell you if you're doing something silly from a biological perspective, and it's also probably the most fun part of doing bioinformatics, I think, is interacting and getting new problems and having to come up with new ways to solve these problems. So to give you a bit of a summary of what I found in terms of the biology, it's that the structure of DNA methylation, the dependent structure, is very strong. It's very, uh, very strong, very spatially regulated. And there's some interesting biology there, as well as what can be used for developing methods for analyzing these experiments by exploiting this correlation structure, which I haven't spoken about today. This dependent structure has cell type differences. In particular, pluripotent cells have quite a different dependent structure than do somatic cells. And we can see evidence of higher order structure in these analyses. What I'm proud of, probably apart from the work that I've talked about, is the fact that 
all the stuff that I've developed is freely available software. It's open source software available from this website in various stages of completeness. Uh, and the reason I'm proud of this is that it means that other people can not only use the methods that I've developed, they're free to take them and make them better, to expand on them, to do things with them that I hadn't envisaged. And really, that's at the heart of most bioinformatics research, is building upon other people's um, methods and software. And I've certainly had to do that as part of my work. Uh, so I just wanted to give a big plug to open source software in bioinformatics as being very critical. So with that, I'd like to thank my supervisors. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought I'd get a nice photo of Terry um, wearing a lovely, lovely red suit. That <laughs> um, I'd really like to thank Terry because, as he said, I did start my PhD over the road at the university. And when I came somewhat crawling back saying that I think I've made, uh, in the words of Joe Bluth, a big mistake, um, he was quite happy for me to get back into, the, um, into bioinformatics and to set me up with a really fantastic project that I've really enjoyed working on. Uh, my other supervisor is Professor Peter Hall, who's in the Department of Statistics. Um, unfortunately, he can't be here today because he's unwell. But I'd really like to thank Peter for his support in allowing me to do what is a bit of a non-standard statistics PhD, in that I am doing a lot of data analysis, a lot of computational work, and a lot of close collaborative work that isn't producing theorems and mathematical uh, results. But he's been very encouraging and supporting of me in doing this inter interdisciplinary work. I'd like to thank. Uh, the many people that have supplied data for this uh, project, uh, in particular Ryan Lister, um, who's now at University of Western Australia, um, Sue Clark and Aaron Statham at the Garvin Institute, whose work I haven't spoken about today, but um, has, have given me lots of access to some fantastic um, data and very useful discussions. Uh, Emma, Whitelaw and Harry at La Trobe University for the AVY methylome data I spoke about. Casper uh, and Rafa um, for some data that got me started on this project very early, my, early on in my PhD. And in particular, just more generally, to people that make their data publicly available. Because again, going with the idea of bioinformatics relying on open source software, having access to uh, open data allows us to do a lot more than we would otherwise be able to do. For the methodology and technology side of things, again, I need to thank Casper and Rafa, because not only did they just supply data from their very early um, experiments, but they gave me lots of very helpful feedback um, on the methods that I was developing and uh, work, um, yeah, lots of really fun discussions on this. Felix at the Babraham Institute for a lot of help in getting to grips with these bisulfide sequencing data sets uh, and for being very uh, helpful in um, modifying his own software to help me do my work. Uh, Toby in, uh, here at WeHi, who was a lot of help when I was learning a new programming language and helping me get my software to a standard that I consider good enough for other people to use, which is, um, as I've said, one of my main aims of my PhD. Keith Satterley in bioinformatics, who's our IT support go-to man, um, in particular for his help and getting my software running and for his forgiveness when I would crash all the servers on a Friday afternoon or while I was overseas, which was possibly even worse. Uh, and just everyone in WeHi Bioinformatics for being a wonderful group to work with. I've learnt a lot from you all, and I thank you all very much for your support and friendship over these last six years now. And again, more generally, just everyone who makes their software open source and publicly available. Funding from the Australian Postgraduate Award and the Victorian Life Sciences Computing Initiative. And finally, I'd particularly like to thank my family and friends, in particular my mum and dad, who are here today, for their support right throughout my PhD and through the last seven and odd years of university life. Thanks very much. Yes. Um, when we did the analysis of the two, the acute viral yellow versus the thickened plastics, did you find um, other variable regions, other alleles that were actually related to the photon assertions? I haven't looked at the full data set here. My role in this project was really to get some software up that I could give to Harry, who's the postdoc in Emma's lab, who would then, I guess, run this genome-wide and then to look more closely at, at these. So I can't, I can't give you an answer on that in particular. 
One challenge of it, this is though that that region containing, we can't look for instance very well at that particular transposon that, that confers the ABY methylone because it's not in the reference genome. So it's slightly hard to get at. As for where, where the differences are between others, this is an ongoing project and I, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know much more about the biological results that they have found from this. Methylation in the islands versus not the islands. The, the islands are typically not methylated. Yes. And then it's typically methylated out of the island. <coughs> um, so, in the, some sort of sense, you'd expect them to be correlated because of the location that they are. Yes. But could you see differences in, say, nearby islands that are unusually methylated? Yes. Yeah, so, in fact, the way we've, the way we've uh, measured the dependence, it actually doesn't depend matter what the level of methylation is. So it it's, um, it's, doesn't matter whether it's a lowly methylated or intermediately or highly methylated. We're, we're kind of just capturing the dependence. So yes, I, I totally understand what you mean by the fact that yes, they're all lowly methylated, so they're going to be correlated. And that is kind of, it is still true, but particularly the within fragment co-methylation that I described, it doesn't matter what the, the average level methylation is. As to relating, nearby islands to one another. We haven't particularly looked uh, at that, no. Much more simple-minded um, question here um, is, uh, when you first introduced the beta value versus position yep. dot plot, yep. your smallest dot has zero cut. Yeah, that's just, <laughs> that that's just an artifact of the, my hasty coding to write a function to produce those plots. Um, you couldn't really have a dot with zero coverage. No. It's going to be just very low coverage. No, I only noticed that today. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks for spotting it, Matt. <laughs> so you appear some correlations as, as you went further apart, never uh, reached zero. Does that just mean that most of the CPGs are, are methylated? Where, whether they are or... or uh, we're not quite sure what to make of that just yet because the difficulty is as we get further out, we have fewer data points from which to measure. So you can see the line gets quite noisy out towards the tail end. Um, with the simulation software that we're writing, what we're trying to, one of the ways we're trying to use that software is actually to simulate data where we only build independence over a very short region, for instance, 200 base pairs. And when we do something like that, basically by controlling the level of within fragment co-methylation, which is this one at the individual read level, if we only have a dependence out to a certain range, we still get what we, apparent correlations of the beta values. So we think they're, in fact, an artifact um, of local correlations kind of accumulating in a sense. But um, we, we're trying to understand that basically by using some simulation models to understand why it's not completely decaying. Um, but yes, I don't have a, an exact answer for that yet. There's been a heap of work, I guess, on methylation in cancer and also in, in ageing is another field where there's yeah. heaps of methylation work. Do you think that, I mean, there's been a lot of work looking at different levels of methylation. Is this something where you want to apply these correlation measures as well to see whether there's specific changes in the relationship between sites? Yeah, so more broadly than just looking at pairs of CPGs, we can look at triples or quadruples. Like the software I've written can sort of generalise to that. So. Yes, we can look at sort of uh, particular regions where, the, f for instance, if they are highly dependent, that's analogous to being highly regulated. So we could potentially identify subregions of the genome where there are differences in the strength of the regulation of the methylation. So we may be able to find, particularly this is true in cancer, that a lot of the DNA methylation changes are hypothesized of being a loss of regulation of the methylation. And when you plot methylation along the genome, see it being strictly zero and then it kind of wavers out because it loses a sense of control there. We may be able to identify those loss of control events by how dependent the methylation is using this co-methylation idea. So yeah, we, we've been thinking of doing that, but we haven't really had a um, great data set for looking into it more closely. So your, your IPS versus the, the adipose tissue, the yeah. IPS had more methylation, and, but also you lost a, lost a lot of the intermediately yeah. methylated regions. So 
How much of that is to do with pluripotency, or, and how, do you know how much is just being a cell line? So if you'd immortalized an adipocyte in some other way, would you see the same kinds of Yeah, I don't think I'm equipped to answer that, except to say that we've seen similar things in other uh, IPSC and embryonic stem cell lines that I've looked at, but how much of that is um, related to, I guess, culturing conditions and things, and for instance, the number of cell cycles that's been passage, passaged through. Um, there's been a little bit of work by a group in Israel that have looked at the same cell line at different passage numbers to see how these sort of things change, but I don't have a data set where I can, I don't have that time course element to the data that I have, um, I've looked at. So except to say that we've seen it in other samples from um, that list of paper, um, I'm not quite sure. I have a question. So in your differentially methylated regions, can you look at why they are differentially methylated? For example, if you look at the DNA sequences and find motifs, um, for transcription related to differential methylation? Uh, I haven't personally, no, um, but I imagine that's what Harry, who's the postdoc working on this um, in Emma's lab, will be, he'll be relating these to chromatin marks and gene expression, which they have done in parallel to the bisulfide sequencing. You showed that uh, uh, DNA methylation at CPG islands was most highly correlated. Um, but I was wondering if there was any other regions of the genome that were also really highly correlated? Yeah, I haven't Obviously. had a good look at that recently. Uh, I did uh, a couple of years ago look at stratifying by other features like transposons or repeat elements more broadly. Um, by enhances that way or something like that? Potentially. I haven't, I haven't looked at that in a couple of years. But um, what, given the software that I've written, it's quite simple to say rather than stratify by CPG islands, here are exons or transposons or whatever feature you might be interested in and produce similar plots and see what happens basically. So um, I may get to looking at that, but I'm hoping that what I, the software I've written allows other people to kind of do some of that work as well. Thanks for the good talk. I just uh, was just wondering that um, when you analyze your data uh, using this software, as you're dealing with whole genome sequencing data, what about uh, if we can uh, compare your conserved region with the data in human genome? Is it your software is going to be uh, useful in that case? Um, so I don't think I understand. The conserved region of your uh, mouse genome in the human genome. Uh, whether they're going to be cross, comp uh, I'd be wary of that. No, um, there's, I've never, I haven't tried anything like that. Um, so no. Thank you.